since the service profit chain may work on average, but maybe not work for every individual company, companies have come up with more straightforward solutions to link customer behavior to profits. Obviously, the ideal case would be if you could make a kind of contract in which we tell the customer, you get some kind of benefit in exchange for business you bring to us. And the more business you bring, the more benefit you get. Well, this exists. It's called a loyalty program. And in the next session, we will decide, we will discuss how these programs are designed and which benefits they bring and why they are actually a much smarter tool than simply giving out points for business. Loyalty programs generally give three different types of benefits. The first one is called efficiency profits. Efficiency profits are profits that result from changing customer buying behavior because of the loyalty program. And there's lots of research that shows that in the moment where customers enter a loyalty program, they change their buying behavior. They may buy more, which is called basket size effects. They may buy more frequently, or they may become less price sensitive, or all of the above. In addition to these efficiency profits, we have effectiveness profits, which are profits that results from better learning about customer preferences over time. A loyalty program allows you to link purchases of the customer together. Think of a supermarket, for example. A supermarket without a loyalty program has no way of knowing whether the same customer comes back every week, twice a week, every day to buy certain items and to link these purchases together because the customers are not identified at the supermarket. Assume you go to a supermarket every day and you pay with cash. There is no way how the supermarket can link your purchases together. But if you have a loyalty program and you show your loyalty card every single time, the supermarket can start linking those purchases together. And this can allow for lots of different things. It can allow for better understanding you. This information can be sold as market research, which is what many, uh, what many supermarkets do. It can be used to give you promotions that are more customized to your needs. And it can be used, for example, by hotel chains to customize your entire service experience. If you constantly ask for certain types of services, let's say a certain type of pillow or a room on a certain floor or in a certain location, at some point through the loyalty program, the company can learn this automatically and give you these things without you having to ask for it. And the last benefit that loyalty programs bring is what is called value alignment because they tell front-facing customer service employees how valuable a customer is, which is especially important when there is huge heterogeneity in customer value and cost per service. Think of an airline. Every airline who has a loyalty program usually has different levels. And these levels are associated with different loyalty cards, and these cards tend to have either different names or even different colors. We will talk about the example of Lufthansa in a minute, where the colors are blue, silver, gold, and black. In the moment where a customer shows the card at check-in, for example, at any interaction with the service employee, the service employee knows how valuable the customer is and they can adapt however they treat the customer depending on this value, which exactly is very consistent with the definition of CRM we had in the first session. Now, all of these things are good. Efficiency profits, effectiveness profits, value alignment. And these are clearly things that loyalty programs can achieve. What loyalty programs cannot achieve is creating true loyalty because true loyalty has two components the first component is behavioral buying the same products regularly and probably this is part of efficiency profits but it also has an attitudinal component of really really being loyal and liking the brand and attitudinal loyalty specifically involves a certain degree of involvement and you cannot create this type of attitudinal loyalty and involvement through a loyalty program on top, there's even the question whether something like true loyalty exists. There is um, a very famous uh, research group, uh, which was led by Andrew Ehrenberg, that studied how people buy stuff. Many, many different brands in many, many different industries. You see here just one example of this slide. And what they found out is two things. First, there is a group of 100% loyal customers, but it is small. You see here on this slide, in this slide, it's about 12%. 12%, or let's make it easy, let's say 10%, one in 10 customers is 100% loyal. One in 10 customers always buys your brand when the customer buys this specific product category. 
It's even lower for small market share brands, but let's say 10% on average. However, when they looked at these 10% and compared them with the 90% who are not 100% loyal, they found out that they also buy much less frequently. The 100% loyal in this example make four purchases per year, while the average in the category is 12 purchases per year. And this means that probably these customers, they are not really loyal, but they don't have enough opportunities to be disloyal. Take a simple example. Assume there are two brands in the market, brand A and brand B. Both have a market share of 50%. You buy randomly a brand the first time you buy, you have the 50% chance of picking brand A. You buy randomly a brand the second time you buy it, you have another 50% chance of picking brand A. So over two purchases, your chance of being 100% loyal to brand A is 25%, 50% times 50%, even if you purchase totally randomly. Over three purchases, it's 12.5%. So sometimes probably customers may appear to be loyal, but they may not actually be loyal, but they may so not care and buy so little, so infrequently that they may just appear to be loyal. And this puts the whole concept of true loyalty into perspective, because probably true loyalty doesn't even exist to begin with. But it doesn't really matter. As a loyalty program, we do not claim to create true loyalty. We only claim to create efficiency, effectiveness, profits, and value in life. Now, I mentioned these loyalty programs that have different groups. You call them tiered loyalty programs. Many, many companies have it. This is just one example here at Lufthansa, where you have basic members, which are colored in blue. You have the, what is called the frequent traveler in silver, the senator in gold, and the home circle member in black. And you may wonder why do we have this? Why do we have all these different levels? And associated to this, why do we have so many different benefits of loyalty? because the rewards that loyalty programs give you fall generally into four categories based on two dimensions. The first dimension is whether the value reward that you get is intrinsic to the firm's core value proposition or extrinsic. And the second dimension is whether it's a tangible, a concrete reward, which is called half reward, or something more subtle, which is called a soft reward. A hard intrinsic reward is essentially giving you a discount based on how much you buy from the company. Discounts on future purchases, guaranteed product upgrades. When you fly a flight with Lufthansa, you get a certain number of points. And once you have a certain number of points, you get one flight for free. The most extreme version of this is, is when you go to Starbucks, after you have 10 coffees, you get the 11th coffee for free. Loyalty programs that only work with hard and intrinsic awards are very similar to something which we'll discuss in a later section, which is volume price discounts. A volume price discount is that you get shampoo cheaper when you buy 10 bottles at once instead of buying one bottle. Well, a loyalty program with part intrinsic rewards is exactly the same system, just that you do not need to purchase the 10 coffees in one go, but that you can split the purchases all the time. But while this is a very, very common characteristic of loyalty program, it's probably not the most interesting one. What is much more interesting is when we move into the other dimensions. For example, intrinsic soft rewards, personalized greetings, special recognition. When you get a special check-in, for example, at Air France, when, you, when the staff is a little bit nicer to you, when you can access a lounge, for example, this is an intrinsic soft reward. Extrinsic hard reward is when you get benefits outside of the scope of the company itself. Discounts on purchases from other firms, for example, and you have in many countries, uh, large loyalty programs that combine many, many firms. For example, you get points in supermarkets and at gas stations and in bakeries. And once you have accumulated a certain number of points, you can discount them in any outlet that belongs part of the program. And you also have extrinsic soft rewards, where, for example, status that a customer has in one loyalty program can be transferred to another loyalty program. When you have a very high level credit card from American Express, for example, you automatically get a special status in some of the, of the large loyalty program hotels. And the question is why? Why do we have all this complexity? Why do we have all these colors? Why do we have all these services, all these different reward types? But, and the reason is because they are all necessary to manage customers the most profitably, depending on how valuable they are to begin with. Hard versus soft rewards. Why do we need hard and soft rewards? 
Well, we do need the hard rewards because the hard rewards are particularly attractive for the customers at the bottom of the pyramid. Think of flying. Those people who fly so much that they actually can get free tickets, but not too much that they no longer want to fly, they may be interested by price reductions, promotions, free products. But once you fly a lot, getting more of the same thing is no longer attractive to you. If you already fly once, two, three times a week, getting another free ticket that you can use has very limited value to you. And this is why for those customers, we need something else. And very often these are soft rewards, the psychological benefit of having such a system. Why do we need intrinsic versus extrinsic rewards? Well, for the same reason. If at some point you consume so much that you are on the top of the customer pyramid, which are, I remind you, the most valuable customers the company has, you are no longer interested in anything related to flying. You don't need any free lounges anymore. You don't need any free tickets. You get enough special status from other things. So we need to give you the ability to use our points for other items. This is, for example, why airlines give you the option to use the points that you accumulate, not only for free tickets, but also to purchase items out of the in-flight catalog, luggage or gifts or pens or whatever you want. And if you are at the very, very top of the pyramid, the black customers, you need to give aspirational rewards, rewards that customers cannot buy. This can range from Lufthansa at some point gave customers the chance to spend an hour in a flight simulator that is usually only accessible to pilots, to giving you special greetings from the CEO or letters or inviting you to exclusive events that you usually cannot get to. There are of course other decisions as well, like the ratio of reward value versus transaction value, how many points you get for every dollar spent. There are questions of expiry dates, which are very technical questions that can, however, hugely influence the profitability of the program. And finally, there is the question of the partner network. Because if you have customers, and lots of them, who probably never consume that much of your product, it might make sense to go into a multi-firm, uh, into a multi-firm loyalty program across different sectors. People may never purchase enough at the gas station in order to become a platinum member at the gas station. But if you combine this, the points and the purchases they make at gas stations and bakeries and supermarkets, the program suddenly gets much more attractive to consumers. Now to finish, there is some things we need to keep in mind when we design these programs because they don't only have benefits, they also have risk. And the biggest risk is they can change customer behavior in counterproductive direction. I told you at the beginning that a loyalty program is a contract. I give you points in exchange for business. This changes the nature of the customer relationship because it makes it much more transactional. And hence, customers try to game rewards program. And there are lots of examples of this where customers become more opportunistic, they may become more costly to serve, and ultimately less profitable because you have changed the mindset and you have made them you have created an incentive for them to be more transactional and to game and optimize the system. There is the risk of creating resentment. If you offer rewards for some customers, it means you do not offer them for other customers. If some customers get treated better, other customers get treated worse. And this may be a constant reminder to them that they are less valuable to you and may ultimately lead to the fact of you losing those customers. And Offering rewards also means that you give some customers access to some elements of your service that they may not be able to purchase otherwise. For example, take an airline. An airline sells first class tickets, uh, probably at 10,000 euros to fly from Paris to, I don't know, New York or Los Angeles or wherever you want to fly. So some of the people who buy these tickets have spent 10,000 euros. Other people who buy these tickets may have saved a lifetime of points in order to afford this flight once. Is this a good idea or not? Should you mix regular and reward customers? Or probably does this alienate the people who actually pay for the service and hence create negative effects to you? Uh, related to this idea of gaming the program and uh, counterproductive behavior, they may specifically reduce the profitability of top level customers because they may be particularly prone to this type of gaming and they may attract the wrong kind of customers. Because loyalty programs, if they are very, very prominently focused on hard benefits, for example, may attract price sensitive buyers who look for the best deal and transaction oriented customers, which may not be necessarily the customers. So 
I want to finish this part on loyalty programs now, and I want to focus from loyalty programs, which, as you have seen, very often focus on the top of the pyramid and trying to identify how valuable customers are and treat those top of the pyramid very, very well, to exactly the bottom and the opposite, which are unprofitable customers and how those should be met. 